Tu, Davana Mona. Very good morning, everybody, and welcome to PNG Boardroom, the latest in a regular series of online business briefings brought to you by Business Advantage PNG, PNG's leading online business magazine. My name is Andrew Wilkins. I'm the publishing director at Business Advantage International, and I'm going to be your host for this morning's discussion on PNG's national budget. Uh, before we start, just a couple of pieces of housekeeping. First of all, um, our sincere thanks to our sponsor for this morning's session, ANZ Bank. ANZ sponsorship enables us to bring this to you free of charge. So our sincere thanks to them, to Mark Baker and his team at ANZ PNG. A couple of technical things. If you're a bit of a Zoom veteran, and I'm sure many are uh, veterans by now, uh, you'll notice the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screens. This enables you to uh, talk to each other. So if you have any questions or comments you want to share uh, during this morning's session, particularly if you've got any questions for our panelists, uh, feel free to jump on and put your comments and questions in that Q&A tab and we'll endeavour to get to as many as we can this morning and even after the event as well. So please feel free to use that. Also a note that this morning's event is being recorded and will be uh, available later on. We'll send you an email letting you know how you can access that video in due course. A couple of notices, um, a big one for us, um, the dates of the 2022 Papua New Guinea Investment Conference have been set. They are the 15th and 16th of August 2022. Um, it seems a long time, long way away from here. Uh, it was only September when we were putting together this year's event. But um, these things take a lot of time and preparation. Uh, so please feel free to put those dates in your diary. The venue, which will be in Brisbane's CBD, and the programme, more details about that will be available to you in the new year. In the meantime, if your organisation is interested in either sponsoring or partnering the event in any way, Feel free to get in touch with us now. Um, we're starting to program and plan the event. Um, you can email us at events at businessadvantageinternational.com. That's events at businessadvantageinternational.com. Uh, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, finally, um, and this is a little bit lighter, um, the December, January issue of PNG Now, PNG's premium lifestyle magazine is about to hit the cafes, restaurants and hotels in Port Moresby and also at select outlets in Ley as well. Um, it's a great read, um, lots of holiday reading, Christmas gift guide and all sorts of things inside uh, that publication. We're delighted to be associated with it and it's well worth your time. If you can't find it physically uh, or if you're outside of PNG, you can find online copies of it available at pngmag.com. Now, that's it, so that's the notices for, uh, for now. Now we're on to our program and uh, we're going to be dedicated entirely for the next uh, 45 minutes or so to the discussion of PNG's national budget, which was delivered in the house behind me um, last Thursday by the Treasurer Ian Ling Stuckey. Joining me to discuss its impact on business are our guests Kishti Sen, who's ANZ's Pacific economist, uh, Duveri Hanau, who is the Executive Director of the Business Council of PNG and uh, Paul Barker um, from the Institute of National Affairs I hope will be joining us a little bit later in our program this morning. So for the moment uh, let's get them on screen. Welcome gentlemen. Andrew I hear you nice to log into you. Excellent great. Well Kisti let's let's start uh, with you. This is quite a, uh, a big budget I guess for tough times but it's, it's uh, quite an expansionary budget. I think we're looking at probably something like 22 billion kina worth of spending uh, based on revenue of only 16.2 billion. So there's quite a large deficit there. We'll cover the deficit in a little bit. But um, first of all, what, your, what would be your major observations, your top line observations uh, about the budget and that we've just seen delivered um, on Thursday last week? Well, uh, thank you, Andrew, and welcome to everyone online. Delighted to be on the panel uh, today and privileged to share the platform with esteemed PNG identities uh, such as yourself, uh, Mr. Paul Barker, and Duveri. So in terms of the 2022 budget, Andrew, um, I think it's a good starting point would be to just consider the current market conditions that Papua New Guinea is facing, because that really gives us some context in terms of what we should be looking for in a budget from a private sector point of view. Now, the business operating environment in PNG has been tough in recent years. 
Uh, like almost every economy in the world, PNG had the COVID-19 induced recession in 2020. Uh, economic conditions last year has been, uh, this year has been weak too. But more importantly, the economy coming into the COVID-19 shock was soft as well. So the non-resource economy, which accounts for 70% of GDP, Andrew, only grew by 1% per year over the five years to 2019. Now that's well below par. Uh, because for the six years to 2015, PNG's non-resource economy was growing by 6.6% per year on average. So altogether, it's been a, a very challenging set of five to six years for the business sector in Papua New Guinea. And against this background, Andrew, uh, the business community would have been looking for a couple of things, in, uh, in my view. The first is some relief, uh, at least... Uh, no additional burden on the cost of doing business in Papua New Guinea, and in particular, the tax load, no additional tax load. And the second angle of insights that the private sector would, be, would have liked to hear in the budget is a pathway or strategies on how the PNG government intends to lift the economic performance in 2022 and beyond and so that businesses can start planning, coming out of the survival mode, start hiring people and transition towards a growth mode where they start servicing the higher demand. So against these two benchmarks, Andrew, I would say that you could argue perhaps the budget does not quite hit the mark. Uh, if you look at the cost side of the equation, well, there is not much relief, if any. Uh, in fact, total tax receipts are forecast to increase to 12.5 billion kina, which equates to about a 15% increase on the 2021 estimate. Now, considering nominal GDP is only forecast to rise by 9% next year, these are Treasury's forecast, the 15% increase in tax collections, and these tax collections, by the way, Andrew, does not include any bank levies or, or, or fees, uh, suggests that businesses are likely to be squeezed a little bit more next year. Now, on the revenue side, uh, I believe it doesn't really matter how you cut the cake, it's how you grow the cake. Uh, so the best way to grow the pie would have been some well-defined strategies on how to broaden the economic drivers uh, because that helps to do two things. Uh, it helps progress the economy towards a balanced state, uh, which is critical for Papua New Guinea, as everyone knows, because a broad-based economy smooths the boom bust cycles that is associated with resource investment. And the second thing a diversified economy does is that it grows the revenue base. So the good treasurer has extended the budget forecast all the way out to 2034, for the next 13 years, and some robust discussion uh, on new sources of growth, I think, would have been quite a good fit into the long-term discussion of the economy. So just a couple of things on how to lift the underperformance of the economy. Uh, Andrew, let's take two more minutes. Sure. Um, the budget says that, look, it will be an infrastructure-led economic recovery. The government uh, plans to invest more money in roads. Uh, health and education infrastructure. It has allocated a budget of 4.8 billion China for its uh, public investment program in 2022, which is up 19.4% on the 2021 figure. Now, the infrastructure spend is good. Uh, we support that. Uh, we have said all along that construction lifts all boats. So the government's desire to channel more money into the sector is supported. Uh, the government hopes that by spending more money in social infrastructure, it can steer the economy towards a 5.4% growth in GDP in real terms in 2022. Now, I'm all for being ambitious, uh, but in my view, I think uh, that's slightly optimistic outlook of the economy and no doubt as we discussed this morning, uh, whether uh, uh, what, what, some of the, uh, what, what looks like a realistic projection for uh, GDP. So all in all, Andrew, the 2022 budget is a big spending budget, as you've said. Yes. Uh, the government is looking to spend 22.2 billion next year which I believe is the highest by any government has spent in PNG's history. Uh, another $6 billion deficit is projected uh, uh, next year, which will push the jet debt to G GDP slightly uh, higher to 51.9% from 50.1% expected this year. In some ways, this is my last comment here, Andrew, in some ways, it kind of goes against the grain of the Marape government, doesn't it? Because the Marape government was all for a conservative government uh, mm -hmm. to, to reduce expenditure, reduce deficit and debt over time. And if you remember, back in 2020, the IMF staff monitor program was brought in precisely for the reason to return the budget 
to a more sustainable footing. And I think that job, because the election is just around the corner, Andrew, I think the job of budget repair or the, or the can of budget repair has been kicked down the road to the next government that will come in into 2022. So I'm going to stop there, Andrew, in perspective. Yeah. Well, it's, as you say, kicking it down the road, it's, it's actually 13 years' time uh, when I think uh, the budget returns the surplus. Um, that is an extraordinarily long period of time to be projecting out forward. That's unusual for a government to project that far out. Very, very unusual, Andrew, because there's a lot of things that are not yet known about the future and a lot of things that we know about the future which hasn't even occurred. And given, given the swings and cycles that are associated with Papua New Guinea's narrow commodity-based economy, I think looking that far out uh, is a bit, bit pr premature. I think uh, what would have been more, because the other thing that you have got to take into account here, Andrew, is that it incorporates three election cycles. Yes. So, so a government could come in uh, next year and change the, 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 the strategy uh, as they see uh, fits into their uh, way of managing the economy. So it's an extraordinarily long period of time. So I think there's something uh, for the next four years would have been a, a, a more detailed discussion about what the government plans to do over the next four years would have been uh, beneficial. Thanks. Um, Duvri, we might turn to you now. And I guess the first thing to, to ask you is, I mean, as, as we've said, this is an enormous amount of increase uh, in the amount of spending on infrastructure. Now, for as long as uh, I've been coming to PNG, um, business have been crying out for spending on infrastructure. And only last couple of months ago, I was talking to David Weir at the Department of Works and Implementation, which has the carriage of the Connect PNG program, which is about building uh, the nation's roads and bridges and so on. Uh, and he was saying that everything I'm planning to do depends on money being there in the budget. Um, are you satisfied that there is now money in the budget? And is this the right money for the right kind of activities as far as business is concerned? Mm. Well, when we had this conversation last year, um, th th there was definitely a sign of optimism uh, in business. And even in 19, um, the repair concept resonated with uh, the private sector. Um, this was meant to be the year where the repair should have now focused into expenditure repair. Uh, we saw those initiatives uh, two years ago, and even as recent as a couple of months on the central bank um, reforms being touted, the uh, superannuation reforms, uh, e even bringing back those uh, important uh, critical observations in the Bogan report in 2015. So, so the revenue side was definitely getting significant attention, which rightfully it should. Mm. However, th this was the year that was meant to be expenditure repair, where we begin to see uh, KPIs plugged right into departments, policies. Are you truly transforming the figures we're giving you? Where is the measurement of productivity? Um, are there changes happening? Can we see our people moving forward? Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. What we do have is a big government that needs big budgets, that needs big funding. Unfortunately, it's going to fund big inefficiencies. And at the end of the day, that's going to cause massive challenges right across, not just the public service, but the market as a whole. And this is largely the challenge that we're facing right now. We were in, um, you know, so to speak, in the trenches with the government, with the public service in really trying to find out when is the expenditure repair going to kick in? When are we going to see uh, um, billions of kina spent on the public service? Uh, the, the 22 figures identify 6 billion. Are we now going to see tangible movement on productivity models that actually lift 60% uh, of that funding is in the provinces? Unfortunately, none of those haven't uh, materialized. And to be fair, that's not the treasurer's job. That's his colleague ministers and, and their agency's job. However, we didn't see that type of direction play. So th this really comes to the heart of the problem, Andrew, that um, uh, we, we are living in a time where, uh, for all intensive purposes, um, this is a socialist budget. It's designed to fund big governments. Mm. It's designed to finance programs. And it's not really designed to grow the private sector. Um, I, I'll, I'll probably just shift my attention into identifying the levy, which has been an active subject um, 
I'm tempted to quote uh, a, a, a rebranding of the name of the levy to a particular consultant, but I won't. Um, <laughs> this, is the bank, this is the levy on banks, uh, or, or one particular bank and one particular telecommunications company um, that's been identified in the budget, what we call, we call it a super profits tax or an additional levy, which basically uh, they're going to levy on, on those organisations, let's name them, uh, Digicel and BSP, who have an effective uh, dominant position in the market. That's correct. And, yeah. and um, again, I, I'm just going to throw out some uh, uh, commentaries that have... Uh, emanated in the past four days. Uh, so, so, so the recent one that came out of JMP, um, Lars Mortensen's publication uh, a couple of hours ago, yep. it, it's a fantastic read. It, it completely highlights banks up Pacific in particular. Uh, w what does it mean in, in, in terms of the drop in shares translating into the drop in dividends and thereafter the drop in, um, uh, in the performance of those shareholders that are part of uh, BSP? Um, and also, there's been fantastic work that have come out from uh, Anthony Smari and, and Charlie Gilichibi, as well as uh, Ian Tarutia, all uh, folks that have been in the supers for a while. Um, and, and, and let's not forget, um, there's, there's also been a lot of commentary coming out from former tax commissioners, um, Sonora Bogan, um, in a conversation in one of those very popular WhatsApp uh, um, um, groups that are sprouting everywhere, can't keep up with them. Um, and, and there's also been a, a fair deal of uh, conversations I've had with members of parliament, both in the coalition and also um, cabinet ministers that do have a differing view on these uh, provisions. And, and the main reason why they have this um, is the, the fact that both Bank South Pacific uh, FG Limited and Digicel PNG Limited, they are growth hubs. It's the market is designed well. It's evolved in a way where they are a major multiplier effect. We've got uh, millions and millions of people that are direct beneficiaries of these yes. shareholding companies. Um, well, BSP in particular, and we've also got millions and millions of people jacked up into the Digicel network. So. The, the conversations that I've had on leading figures in these organizations, and, and I'm just going to spit out some numbers so folks can appreciate the impact that it'll have. E effectively, 200 towers in Digicel are unproductive. And so that would mean um, a complete ra rationalization on the, on, on the business model. They, they unfortunately have to be scaled down or shut off. Now, what that translates into is roughly... Um, uh, Forty percent of those towers are in provinces, and the scale goes up. In the districts, it's roughly sixty-five percent. And then, when we look at the LLGs, in 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 some cases, one hundred percent of several LLGs will, will simply won't have these uh, towers that are operational. And uh, again, from a practical standpoint, um, several members of parliament use these towers. Uh, in emergencies, they get the choppers out there to pick up mothers. Uh, this is where they use um, uh, communications to supply education materials. So, so the net effect of um, of the people of Papua New Guinea is basically the shutdown of these 200 towers, and in in most cases, it's it's a blackout in complete communications. Now, That's when we crazy. look at, yeah, no, no, it's it, it is, and, and then. When we look at the BSP side of things, uh, on a similar scale, 15 branches are not product are not profitable, and these 15 branches are uh, spread right across um, the, uh, the the 22 uh, provinces. And then, but the uh, the more pressing number is there's hundreds of sub branches that are purely there to service the the mums and dads, the the, the agro. Um, uh, farmers, the SMEs. Now, they, they do not have any um, uh, uh, profit um, model surrounding them. It's purely a CSI extension service. That, unfortunately, has to be the first one that needs to be clipped. Um, I, I, I'm okay with people suffering with data, 
But when you have uh, teachers uh, out in um, the rural areas that use these sub branches for their wages, this is the only way that they can get uh, money from their families uh, back and forth. When that's completely off, that that does cause major service delivery challenges. Noted. Um, so, so just just to go back to Kishti on that, there does seem to be the argument that we're killing the goose that lays the golden egg by providing the super tax. But the government does have a revenue challenge, does it not? If it wants to fund these programs in the budget, there's a lot of um, revenue they're banking on for next year, uh, including revenue from increased revenue from the mining and petroleum sector with the reopening of the Porgera uh, gold mine and so forth. How realistic are those expectations? How solid are those expectations as far as the revenue, even without the, uh, the super tax that Duveris responded to, uh, to address just now? Well, let's just look at the tax revenue, uh, Andrew, because the, the super tax, as you call it, or the levy, sits outside the total tax receipts. Uh, this is just the way the government presents it. Now, those tax receipts uh, are based on the government's forecast of uh, GDP growth. And here they would be looking at nominal GDP, which is essentially the real GDP growth. And you put on top of it the, the increase in uh, commodity prices to get your nominal uh, growth in GDP. Um, so... 5.4% growth in real GDP. Uh, the government, I've looked at the government's uh, assumptions. Uh, a lot of that is coming from the, the mining sector. So a restart of poker has got a lot to do with it. But bear in mind, this is Treasurer's own analysis. Uh, when poker mine closed in the, uh, was it 2020, they did some analysis and they said that uh, the poker mine's contribution to real GDP growth was 0.7 percentage points. So that's 0 0.7 percentage points, bank 10, if you think a program will be operational for all of 2022, which looks like it, most likely it will be from April next year. Uh, so that's 0 0.7%. Uh, a lot of the additional growth is coming from the agriculture sector, and this is where I defer from the government. Now, the agriculture sector has grown uh, consistently for Papua New Guinea, but a lot of that is largely driven by the informal sector which grows in line with the population anyway. So these are the people who live in the rural communities who grow fruits and vegetables to sustain their livelihood, and they'll take the access to the market. Now, if you look at the agriculture sector and strip out the key commodity exports for Papua New Guinea, i.e. your coffee, your cocoa, your palm oil, and your copra, as well as coconut oil, they have all, except for palm oil, they have all gone down over the last six or seven years. Right. Papua New Guinea's real challenge in the agriculture sector, and I'm not sure whether building more roads is the right fix for it in the near term, is to provide support to the growers so they're maximizing the use that they for, for every hectare or half a hectare of farm that they're farming. And there's a, there's a lot that can be done by providing good inputs to the farmers to maximize their use and reverse the downward trend in some of the key commodities and get the, the, get the volumes up back towards the historical evidence. For example, with coffee, Papua New Guinea uh, usually exports about 60,000 tons of coffee a year. So there's a million bags or 60 kilo bags. Now it's way down to 40,000 now. A lot of that coffee is locked up in the highlands where it's very difficult to get to. Uh, and obviously when the price is high, it motivates the farmers to get up to the mountains and bring the cherries down. But when the prices are not as high, as profitable, they, they, they leave coffee farming for a year and go into some vegetable farming or some even move away from the area and seek work somewhere else. But if you have some soft uh, skills like building good relationships between the middleman and the growers and the exporters, you can solve a lot of these problems in the near term and get the production up. Right. Uh, but some providing some technical support to how to look after your yield. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, maintain uh, farms and gardens. And this is where I think the government should have put a lot of energy and, and focus into. I don't think price subsidy is a good fix for uh, the agriculture system, which is only a short-term solution. I yeah. think some providing some good inputs to the farmers, some uh, uh, providing like planting material, disease-resistant clones. I think this is the way to go forward. Maximize what you've got before you start building roads and improving infrastructure, because then can just come on top and take the volumes right up to levels uh, uh, where PNG really should be sitting at. And let's face it, the demand for PNG's food commodities is extremely strong. 
Well, yeah. All of it, it goes to the Asian market. It's very niche. It's sustainably grown. It's high in demand. It's highly flavored. So anything Pre-Energy produces will be sold in, 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 the, in the international market. There is no question about it. So I think uh, when we talk about agriculture, we should really be talking about what the government is doing with the rural uh, commodity exports rather than just the sector as a whole. Uh, a lot of it is informal sector, and that, that's growing. We shouldn't be just get complacent in saying that, look, agriculture is doing well, so that's 3% growth coming every year. As to GDP growth, we, we can be complacent about it. I don't think I think that's the right way to go. No, no, Dukishti. Um, Deberi, the, um, uh, are there any other measures in the in the budget that you you welcome as far as uh, measures are concerned? I noticed, for example, there is a an allocation of money in the budget to pay some of the arrears that the government owes uh, to business. Um, is that going to be sufficient, and are there other measures that you think are particularly beneficial to business? You know, definitely. Um, if we look at treasurer's um, lightning the burden key ticket items. Um, Definitely uh, paying the supers. That's been a, that's been an ongoing challenge for many years. So, so that allocation is welcomed. Uh, whether it's sufficient or not, we'll, we'll have to ask the folks at Number One Super and, and TISA on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, yeah, you're right o- on the arrays. That's a welcoming um, uh, position as well. We we, we alloc- uh, uh, arrays is actually divided into two spaces here. So number one, there is that that uh, traditional uh, service provision that's um, been outstanding since, well, Pacific Games in, in some instances. So, so, so that um, provision is, is welcoming. But, but the more problematic one is the GST reimbursements. We haven't seen any, any movement around that. So, so, so therein lies a major challenge on uh, how much of that is going to be GST reimbursements, how much of that would be on service provision. But, but if you look further in, uh, in those uh, top ticket items uh, in, in, in lightening the burden, uh, SDG 8 on, on gender-based violence, uh, the health program, health functional grants, they are welcoming. But as I mentioned earlier, if you have a fledging and very inefficient, um, unproductive public service, none of that resourcing is really going to matter. And, and, and that's where... Um, this was the year that we really wanted to see some degree of um, clarity, some degree of direction that's actually moving in the budget space. I, I, I do agree with, with Kishti on the first instance regarding infrastructure. The, the, the big movement that's happened, and I think it's a watch this space, is um, the, uh, the Australian government, but in particular, <clears throat> the um, collective... Uh, our economies, US, New Zealand, Japan, and Australia, in financing the PNG power programs, the PEP. Yes. Uh, a, a lot of conversations have been around this isn't working, this hasn't been implemented where it is. We're now beginning to see uh, the PEP financing uh, kick starting. We're beginning to see transmission distribution lines uh, fixed. Still, major problems on the generation side. But but that's a that's a massive indication that um, there is uh, a lot of energy in getting the PEP fired up. The the, the second part is also um, the AI double FP uh, that was launched um, last year. We're now beginning to see that's the Australian that infrastructure facility uh, finance facility for the Pacific, the Australian government program. Th- th- that's correct, and yeah. and, and we're, we're beginning to see movements in uh, in that financing mechanism at play. Uh, again, I, I just want to give a quick comparison why the AIFFP, uh, the PEP financing, and all these others uh, that are coming into, into the CapEx budget um, compared to the China exims. Uh, the, 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 two, the two big uh, uh, multiplier factors is uh, these financing tools are designed to have a high degree of um, uh, um, governance involved. So we are getting um, high level um, operators in the market, all the tendering processes uh, are definitely in play. But but more importantly, there's a massive local content drive. Um, so, so we will be seeing a lot of action uh, in the construction sector, in the engineering sector, actively participating 
in the PEP programs, in the PNG ports programs, and others that are coming on board on the AI WFP. The other CapEx uh, I just want to highlight, and it, it comes back to my original uh, comment about productivity, big government. For, for the first time, we're actually seeing some serious allocation to the Department of Information Communication Technology, shifting from analog to digital, uh, focusing on digital government expenditure. All of these strengthen uh, the doing business side. All of this help um, uh, remove all the all the all the sludge, all the fledging that's been um, uh, uh, evident in government. So, 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 so some great items that are in play, um, and it's a mixture of grants and zero percent, one percent fees from um, uh, from um, Australia and also the other economies in the West. Um, and, and again, that that element of the repair side, I, I give uh, a lot of credit to the treasurer and the team there. Uh, we, we are seeing for the first time a, a much more structured way in procurement, uh, uh, active participation from businesses. But but again, uh, Andrew, the, the biggest challenge I see is, unfortunately, those examples I've given are just in a minority. If you look at that PIP capex side there's a lot of programs projects that are that are that are in the thought process and and, and the greatest concern we have in business there's not going to be a high degree of productivity and accountability in the dispensation of, of, of that side of the budget and 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 that's where even in the png connect as you mentioned earlier a lot of highways a lot of roads um but but is it really going to materialize in getting the best to come here, build those roads that can last. So when my girl gets her uh, license, <laughs> when she's 18, those roads are actually still there. Good question. And, and we might at uh, this stage, uh, uh, Paul Barker's joined us, I believe. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Hello, Paul. Thanks very much for your patience joining in the conversation. Welcome this morning. Paul Barker is the Executive Director of the Institute of National Affairs. That's the industry-funded think tank in Port Moresby. Paul, um, I just wanted to ask you a question about the affordability of the spend. It is a big spending budget um, comparatively, and there is a large debt component, a, a deficit component, almost just under nine, sorry, sorry, six billion kina. How affordable is that, um, that deficit as far as managing, uh, financing that deficit as, as far as you can see? Well, it goes back to what your two uh, fellow panelists were, how they were responding earlier the realism of um, of a lot of the budget. If you remember, this budget was forecast for last year. A lot of the growth level was forecast for last year. That didn't occur because of COVID and a number of other factors. And yet, 2021, we did actually see some of those commodity prices rise quite well. Um, the next year's budget is very much based on, uh, on those commodity price rises also being strong um, and quite what the difference is between um, 2021 and 2022 is a little hard to sort of envisage. Yes, you've highlighted there that uh, Pogoro is hoped to be open by the middle of the year. Well, that depends on a lot of things. Yeah, they actually undercalculated the impact of the closure of, Bogan, of uh, Pogoro in 2020. And now they seem to be exaggerating the impact, assuming that it actually does happen. But the, the GDP impact across the board has highlighted, very difficult to sort of forecast what's going to happen in 13 years' time. Well, look, yesterday we saw a massive drop in uh, global uh, stock market prices related to uh, what seems to be a relatively minor um, variant of the of the virus. They sip, skipped Epsilon and all the rest of them, and they've moved straight on to the latest uh, <laughs> uh, variant. But yes, it doesn't seem to have such, and yet the response, the market response, commodity price response, et cetera, has demonstrated that there's considerable volatility. So the capacity to forecast what's going to happen next year, let alone in several years' time, is going to be really challenging. Um, no, the revenue just, it's re sorry carry on and the revenue is and it is interesting because over the last you know if you go back to 2000 and 
six who had 40% of your revenue coming from tax revenue coming from mining and petroleum. And that disappeared almost down to almost zero by 2016. And since then, it's been picking up somewhat. But you've seen this big increase in um, dependency on, on uh, personal taxes and on this growth in GST. And uh, and a real decline in in, in uh, tax revenue collections from the corporate sector um, normal company tax. So you're seeing, and and frankly, that depends on jobs being created. You can't. You, you're going on trying to squeeze and squeeze, but we actually have to generate the employment and generate the economy. So we're seeing these figures, and yet for the last since 2014, we've seen almost no growth and in many years actually a decline in employment. So if that's going to be the main source of revenue, we've got real problems. So as you can see, what's happened was, is that we have been depending on uh, on borrowing increasingly. Uh, so it now comes to 2.3 billion in uh, interest payments. Of course, that's one of the arguments that they're making for, for having this, uh, mon- well, dominant player tax. Yes, um, yeah. Because of course, BSB and the financial institutions are funding the government to a large extent, but in turn, they get quite good revenue from the process. So the government's trying to find a way of clipping and getting some of that back for, for nothing. So uh, that's a, a little bit of a challenge. But as uh, Deveri indicated, it has significant ramifications on, on customers, on, on superannuation funds and so on, and on, on rural households who are dependent on telecommunications and, and so on. So. Noted. Gentlemen, we've got a few questions from our audience this morning, so I might throw a few of these out to you if you don't mind. Uh, This first question is about, uh, which maybe we'll go to you, Duvery, if you don't mind. Um, This question is, what are the best options for the government and business to work in partnership to assist in the financing challenges uh, that the government faces? Uh, It's a government taxing its way out uh, of the problem, especially the dominant industry player levy seems to create more problems than solutions. So, so, so we, we've obviously had these sorts of options floated around with the treasurer uh, and the advisors. Um, uh, yes, d- definitely um, controlling debt levels is critical as, as per the um, GDP debt ratio. But there have been several options about um, BSP and, 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 and Digicel considering the, to purchase more treasury bonds. Um, and 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 do, do the fundraising through that man. Of course, that's all, that's obviously going to whack out the um, the debt ratio. But that's a much more um, uh, productive solution. And then have a um, a very low interest rate um, uh, when it's um, uh, looking at harvest. The other, of course, if we look at Digicel BSP purely as the um, as the two dominant players, what could they do? Uh, again, there's a number of options in, in doing that internal fundraising. Could their uh, huge um, CSR spends, uh, could, could that further add into um, government service uh, delivery programs? Uh, could, could they look at ways in which um, more resourcing could be pumped into those areas? Uh, and then, of course, th- th- there is the other component where um, reduce the... Um, uh, the uh, the debt levels of of the government that these two entities carry, and and could there be creative ways in deferrals on on their payments? So 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 there are multiple ways in which uh, these two entities can can definitely uh, um, support the the government um, in its revenue raising. And and again, I I think it's important that um, we completely understand the the repair strategy. We understand. There has to be a revenue strategy. Mm. Um, what what we don't understand, and, and this is where the real challenging part is, um, elements of the government and the service delivery provisions are already being uh, absorbed by these businesses, and that's the real killer that's going to happen. I, I I'm not entirely worried about KCH drops um, and, and so forth purely in terms of government revenue as uh, shareholders in BSP. The, the, the real challenge right now is um, th- these institutions themselves are not, in some cases, the financial inclusion program that started off as a CSI, even the universal 
access uh, data program that started off as CSIs, they, they have now become actual functional business models that many SMEs are benefiting. And so it's, it's that part of the impact. It's not just a, a social problem um, that um, these levies will impact. Uh, it's actually impacting bona fide SME businesses, which is what the Marapa government has been all about. So um, again, j- j- just to go back, answering that question, um, as I mentioned, uh, you can raise that money via other means uh, and, and taxation definitely is not um, should not be one of them. Yeah. No. Next question. Um, uh, the next one is about, uh, I guess, uh, implementation or accountability of government agencies. And Paul, we might turn to you for this one. Uh, PNG has traditionally had quite a challenge in actually dispersing the money uh, that it has allocated in its budgets to spend. So what measures do you think could uh, be done? How will the government hold implementing agencies accountable for the delivery of this budget to give confidence to business? Yeah, well, of course, the numbers that you see in the budget are just numbers. <laughs> when it comes down to it, you you never see that actually being applied. And in under, other countries, you actually have to, in some countries, you have to actually follow the budget that's been mandated by parliament. Mm. In this country, it's really just a ceiling. So uh, as you know, when it becomes uh, infrastructure, invariably doesn't get implemented during the year. And there's usually for many years anyway, there's been overexpend in various uh, salaries and, and various other components. Accountability, well, that's, yeah, we do have um, various accountability mechanisms here. Uh, you have the mid-year and the end-of-year reports, both of which were late this year. But the Auditor General's reporting is like 2014 for the last uh, audit of the overall government public account. So Mm -hmm. the mechanisms for ensuring um, delivery and accountability are very, very weak uh, accountability to parliament and to the and to the wider public. So that is a that is a real challenge. Um, The mechanisms involve greater um, public disclosure all the way through the system. And I'm afraid a lot of the latest uh, borrowing that's been occurring, for example, under the Belt and Road Initiative and so on. Mm. It is impossible to find the details of those financing uh, arrangements. Who has what responsibility, what liabilities fall on the state-owned enterprises and what fall back on the government and so on. So a lot, we've got a new procurement uh, act, but this, it's still very weak on accountability mechanisms and the where it's foreign financed, it's allowed to just follow, follow the overseas um, administration rules that are, are to be applied by China or, or whoever. So that, that's severely problematic. And as as uh, highlighted by the very earlier, you still got a lot of ghosts in the, on the public payroll. Uh, the Treasury indicated they've been working on trying to tackle the, their own Treasury's ghosts and, uh, and the national court's been working through theirs, but they are extensive. And, uh, and one needs to have that accountability starting within those institutions. Clearly, when it comes to implementation and in this budget, there's a big increase, as you highlighted, for infrastructure, infrastructure, um, particularly at the district level, uh, those projects, but many of the major national projects too, are very, very weak in the procurement process and in the accountability process. But when it comes to the recurrent budget and an expenditure on um, wages and salaries, clearly those areas like health and education really do need increases in um, expenditure. We need extra teachers all the way through the system and health workers, but we need to make sure that the ghosts that are in the system of the public service are not there and that we do have genuine right sizing to redirect from uh, low priority to higher priority. And when it comes to those expenditure items, those roads and so on, look, some of those roads uh, and infrastructure on the Connect PNG. Yes, some of them are valuable. What is most valuable is um, accessing, enabling farmers to access basic reliable access rather than all these very major um, ticket items where, for example, you know, one going from Kyunga down to down to Daru, look, you've already got a road. It's called the, the river, the Fly River. So why 
yes, maybe nice to have a road, but you know, it, you've got to maintain all these things as well. After maintenance is, we always spend about a tenth of what is needed on maintenance, and uh, and we get rid of the mechanisms that we set up to try and ensure maintenance with a level of accountability like the National Roads Authority. And now we're establishing a new transport corporation. Or, corporate, um, or whatever it's called, with a trust fund. And we noticed that all the people who were from civil society, the private sector, who were on the National Roads Authority board are replaced by bureaucrats. So I'm not sure that's going to enhance accountability and it would, is intended to be a much larger fund. Noted. We've got just a couple more questions before we finish. Um, uh, DV, so, um, sorry, uh, Kishti, we might come to you. Um, mm-hmm. th- the questions here is about the, the funding gap, the, the, the deficit and how it's being financed. The, the Treasurer made a big, uh, big statement about how the government has gone about uh, getting more concessional funding for this deficit so that the cost uh, to the country of paying the interest bills on, on this loans are, are significantly lower over time. Have they done a good job of financing the deficit, in your opinion? Uh, yes, I think so. I think so. And one of the reasons lenders, lenders are providing a lot of support to the PNG government because they can see the potential for the economy going forward. Uh, and hence, all, all the, uh, hence they're underwriting uh, the lending for the PNG government. Now, obviously, running large spending budgets has, uh, with insufficient revenue, has put, push, pushed deficit higher and debt as well. But to be honest with you, I'm not really perturbed about the level of debt in PNG. Debt as a proportion of GDP is still under 52%, uh, well below the legislative limit of 60%. And 52% for a developing country like Papua New Guinea is not even close to the median for similarly rated countries. And if you look at the potential for the economy, I've always believed that Papua New Guinea has got a very good economy uh, going forward. The problem with PNG is getting some of these big ticket project items towards commencement. So getting these projects committed and fast tracking them towards commencement, I think that's where the real challenge and the frustration is with a lot of people. And once one of some of these projects come through, and I think we will we'll won't be talking about debt to GDP again in the future. Noted. Um, just to finish off now, we are close to time. So this will be the, the last question. And, and I guess it's looking forward. Uh, Kishni, right at the beginning in his comments, made, made the observation that this is a, a budget, certainly with uh, the national elections for next year, middle of next year in mind. Uh, it's a, maybe an election budget. Um, uh, so I'm just wondering what you think, and we'll do maybe just 30 seconds with each of you to finish off. Um, what do you feel this uh, budget does to instill greater confidence in the economy, uh, and particularly maybe to encourage even a greater confidence in investors uh, who might be looking to invest in PNG? So do very. We'll start with you. Just 30 seconds, please. No worries. Um, look, look for the investors out there, domestic and and, and international. Um, you're going to have a supplementary budget in, in August, September. So all of this pain that we're all commenting on um, and despair, there's going to be a reconfiguration. Uh, so, uh, and, and whether that reconfiguration translates into uh, removal of some of these very, very challenging um, fiscal features in the market, um, that, that's, a, that's a risk. But the comforting factor is that does it instill Confidence, uh, well, the only confidence that's been instilled is AIFFP, the Australian government, the New Zealand government, and government, government, governments. So it doesn't instill any private foreign investment at all. Mm. So, so we are going to see those inflows coming. In fact, the largest investor in 2022 is going to be the Australian government again. Wow. Uh, and, and that's an indication of what this budget is. It's not designed for foreign investment. Mm. Paul? Yes, um, I, I agree with Kishti's suggestion that the uh, restraining the, well, managing the debt is has been a, a positive achievement, to, surprisingly, even though we do have risen to 2.3 billion in debt servicing. Uh, and the fact that it is within a reasonable level is, is positive, so long as one actually can deliver the uh, the revenue that can actually manage it and restrain that expenditure it's a an, an election year there's a quite a lot of wasteful uh, expenditure in there a good sign was that the governors um did actually restrain the demand for money they agreed to 
to uh, hold back during this next year so that funds can be diverted. In the long run, the investment in education and health is essential, and it is an investment in the future, into the future, which is critical. Uh, Kishti, finally, your final comments. Okay. My key takeaway, Andrew, in terms of uh, getting confidence under the budget is uh, the government's confidence in getting the program of mine open next year. Now, if the government can get that over the line, that will be a big signal to the foreign investors that, yes, this government can Absolutely. work with investors and can get some of the projects which are pending. I know Papua LNG has been given the green light, but what we go for in my mind is the big one because I see a lot of local value added in that project. If that project can be committed soon on the back of Pogera, and I think that's good news for Papua New Guinea as investors as well. That's one good uh, positive aspect from the budget from my point of view. Noted. Gentlemen, um, thank remembering you so much. the agriculture. Yes. Gentlemen, we have to leave it there, but thank you very much indeed uh, to Kishti, Paul, and for Duveri for joining us this morning. Uh, Gentlemen, your time is valuable and we appreciate you taking the time of it to spend it with us this morning. Thank you very much. This debate and discussion will, of course, continue and it's a very important discussion. Uh, but for today, for this morning, that's all. Thank you very much to everybody who sent in their questions and for all of you for attending and participating. Um, before we go, just a thanks again to our sponsor for this morning's event. That's ANZ Bank. Um, thanks very much to Mark Baker and his team at ANZ. Um, this PNG boardroom briefing has the latest irregular series uh, that we bring you. Um, you can find old, old uh, ones on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, we're going to be taking a break, however, over the Christmas and New Year period. I hope you're going to get a chance to have a break as well. We'll be back uh, with our next um, PNG boardroom briefing in February next year. February 22, 22 does have quite a ring to it. In the meantime, to keep in touch with what's going on uh, in business in PNG, uh, go to businessadvantagepng.com. Uh, you can also follow us on the socials on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and so on as well. That's it for today. Uh, until next time, please have a very happy and safe festive season. Uh, please stay COVID safe. And as always, may your business have the advantage. Good morning.